Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Just on behalf of the Intensive Care Society, uh, I think at the moment we've mainly got the panel online, but for those joining, uh, so this is hosted by the ICS as part of our charitable activities. Uh, a great honour for us to have a large international panel, which uh, he's going to outline. So welcome to all of you and thank you for taking part and uh, welcome and thank you to all those joining to listen in. Good. Thank you, Ganesh. Um, so thank you all for joining. I know we have a panel of 22, but I know that there are at least 800 of you out there that are listening in as well. You're very welcome. We will try to stick very strictly to the allotted hour that we have such that you can get back to those patients that you're tending. Uh, the quick thank yous to the Intensive Care Society and its staff for arranging this and putting it on and for UCL partners as well for helping so much with the administration and for producing outputs. This is being recorded. It will be available on YouTube after this. And for those panel members here, we will circulate a document uh, to produce as a published article, which we hope will appear in The Lancet to try to communicate today's findings a little more broadly. The panel represents uh, eight different countries. Uh, we have represented China, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the World Health Organization with representation there, particularly from Denmark. All of them are very distinguished speakers, but much more importantly, they're practically experienced. And that's really what today's about. We're going to try to draw out very briefly the experience that everyone's got to try to find commonalities of experience, problems we're all facing and don't understand, and perhaps practice that might be working better for some than for others that we can all emulate. The topics we're going to cover essentially are starting from the hospital elevation of care to CPAP and its potential use or not, modes of mechanical ventilation and people's experience of that and weaning use of adjuncts, uh, our management of fluid balance and pressor therapies, instance uh, causes and management of acute renal failure, coagulopathy, a major issue now that most of us are facing, and our approaches to prophylaxis and treatment, and then briefly some words about infection that we may or may not be seeing and its management. What I propose to do is open each topic, perhaps ask some comments from the Brits who I can see online, and then work our way around the other relevant countries. And I'd ask each speaker really to give us their experience, um, what they're hearing from other people in their patches and their views about what they think is working and what they think is perhaps working less well. And if we could be succinct about that, I'd be very grateful. So let's start with CPAP. We've got a patient that's come into hospital. We may or may not have asked them to voluntarily uh, prone themselves. We've given them augmented oxygen supplies we have decided that something else is needed. Now, are we going to intubate this person when we see a high work of breathing and a high requirement for supplemental oxygen, or are we going to use CPAP? So I'm gonna start with Mervyn Singer. Mervyn, you have um, not proselytized, but have led um, experience with CPAP in this country, perhaps to a degree. Could you briefly summarize your experience and what you think is best practice based upon what you've seen. Lovely, thank you very much, Hugh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, um, I, I think uh, obviously it kicked off in China um, and there was an initial rush to intubate and ventilate everyone. And then obviously they ran out in Wuhan very quickly out of uh, ventilator resource, intensive care resource. And then they moved over to non-invasive ventilation. The same happened in Italy. Um, and again, they realized that it was not sustainable to keep everyone intubated and ventilated at, at a very early stage. And again, through lots of colleagues and friends in China and Italy, uh, everyone was telling me, go CPAP, you know, in particular, um, seemed to be not necessarily a panacea, but something that was actually very effective in keeping a proportion of patients you know, and the estimates varied, but about half the patients off mechanical ventilation. And so it was uh, a strategy we adopted very early at uh, University College Hospital. Um, I know at the time, this is oh, three, four weeks ago, there was the, oh, if they need, you know, more than X litres of oxygen intubate. But again, from 
the experience of Italy and China, we thought, OK, let's give CPAP a trial. And we conglomerated guidelines that had come from the Lombardy region and the Ligurian region, where when patients came in, we looked at a, how they responded to a, an oxygen challenge, 15 litres a minute. And depending on the result, you know, clearly if they were moribund or whatever, then the decision was obviously made early intubation or not. But this, depending on their response to an oxygen challenge, they went into a different pathway. A red pathway where they had a trial of CPAP for 15, 30 minutes. If they responded well in terms of oxygenation and importantly work of breathing, we could continue them on the CPAP. If they didn't, again, we asked whether they were an appropriate patient for intubation. And your experience, would you, would you think that you've got the same experience that you described from others? Do you think you're finding roughly half of your patients go yeah. back from CPAP to come off? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you some data in a sec, you. It, it was just very quickly, the, what we found was that you could categorise patients into those who wouldn't cope, and you'd find that out very very quickly on CPAP. Either they were tube intolerant or their work of breathing uh, wasn't good or didn't recover, oxygenation didn't recover, and those who actually did settle very well. And so a large number of these patients we were able to keep on CPAP. Not all of them continued on CPAP, and some needed to go on to intubation and ventilation, and some, uh, you know, uh, CPAP was a ceiling of care. And I'll give you a few little bits of data. So these are, please, you know, preliminary data. They need verifying, but this is off our hospital computer system. But of about 840 patients who have come into intensive care, oh, sorry, to hospital at UCH, 133 have received CPAP, of whom 28 have progressed to mechanical ventilation. 32 have died with CPAP as a ceiling of care. 34 have gone home. 10 are still on CPAP and 29 are improving. They're now just on face mask oxygen or going towards home discharge. And we've had, of you know, as I mentioned, 28 needed mechanical ventilation, but in total, 92 mechanically ventilated. But because we've been able to keep people off ventilators, we've taken in 54 transfers from other hospitals to relieve the burden there. Of those, 24 have died, seven have gone to the ward or home now, but we have still about 60 still ventilated. So clearly, if you can keep them on CPAP and they turn around quickly, you can get them off and in the right pathway towards home in days, rather than, as I'm sure we're all finding, many of these patients are taking weeks to recover. And so the other fine thing. And then I'll move on to others. Um, how long are you progressing for? Are you giving, if they look like they responded, we'll keep them on CPAP for days, or are you cutting and running earlier? Yeah. So the point I was going to make, our respiratory physicians have basically now taken the burden of care. And so they're managing now most of the CPAP patients. Um, mm. And again, we found it depends on the patient. We've had some patients who are comfortable on CPAP, and we've had some who are up to seven, eight, nine days and have progressed whereas others who aren't coping after three, four. So it's very much patient dependent. OK, um, very quickly then, before we move internationally, Luigi, you're at St Thomas's Hospital and you've perhaps led um, a slightly different plan from earlier on, which is to intubate slightly earlier. Do you think that is that your view? And how do you sit in this uh, discussion about CPAP early and long or intubation early? I'm assuming Luigi is with us. He may, of course, be still stuck on the intensive care unit. No answer for Luigi. China, maybe I could come to our Chinese colleagues. Um, what was your experience with CPAP? Obviously, you were in very early with this, and you probably have the greatest experience so far. Did you use CPAP? And if so, what was your experience of that? Dr. Dr. Su will answer this question. I remember last time I, I, I answered this, and maybe uh, Dr. Su will have something okay. to say. Yeah. So um, I'm Jun Wei, and um, I, I will represent Dr. Uh, Hong Liu from the ICU, and he is the leading expert in ICU of our hospital. And according to his opinion, we think that 
in, at least in our center, CPAP is not strongly recommended in COVID-19 patients in our idea. And normally we prefer to give patients high flow nasal tethering treatment. And like for the timing of mechanical ventilation, we will delay a little bit in young patients if like high flow nasal catheter uh, treatment is not very uh, like not very efficient in this. But while in elder patients, we were earlier, I mean, like uh, make it earlier for the timing of medical uh, mechanical ventilation. And because in our opinion, CPAP maybe had, maybe like patients will have less intolerance to this therapy. And also it will easy to lead to lung injury. So in our center, we are not very strongly recommended this. So that's our opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what do our colleagues think? I'm thinking, obviously, we've got colleagues here from Italy, maybe if she goes to Italy, then perhaps Spain, then Germany in that order, and then France. Do our Italian colleagues have a view on this? OK, we'll move then to our French colleagues. If you're able to dial in. Not, this Maybe we've got some... Okay. I just opened my microphone. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so sorry, I was just in a, in trouble with another issue in the same time. But if I well understood, it was about the CPAP and the use of CPAP. Uh, and I have to say that uh, uh, indeed, in my unit, we did uh, absolutely our best not to ventilate invasively the patient and not to intubate the patient. But we decided not to use uh, mostly the CPAP but more the moderate to high flow oxygen delivery. So it, it's another option that we decided to apply. And we only did a few patients with CPAP. OK, well, that's interesting. And there is a trial starting in Britain, which will be comparing CPAP and high flow nasal oxygen and so forth as well. Um, do our colleagues in Berlin have a view on this? Uh, what's the German experience of this and then the Spanish? Yes, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, Thank very you. nice. This is Pian Weiss from Berlin. Hello. Uh, so, yeah, we have some experience with it, and uh, we would also rather not uh, do – we do non-invasive ventilation, which we should differentiate from pure CPAP. We don't do a lot of pure CPAP here. But we're actually switching from um, high-flow nasal oxygen directly to intubation. And the reason for this is we saw some self-inflicted lung injury. We saw very high tidal volumes on these patients, especially if they were on low um, uh, additional pressure. But of course, it's very interesting to hear that it might work, especially if you don't give support pressure. And I think we will have to take a close look at the data that will come out of that. But uh, what is our experience is that if you decide uh, to go for NIV, and as I said, we don't do, but if you decide for it, then you really have to closely re-evaluate it on an hourly basis to make sure you don't miss the point when the patient actually has to be intubated. Well, thank you. That's that's very wise. And again, we our own unit doesn't have much experience of using high flow nasal oxygen. We had problems with oxygen pressure in terms of, of delivery, so that had limited our use. Um, we do have colleagues here from Spain. Perhaps I could ask you your experience of, of this. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. In Spain, we are, we are using mainly CPAP outside of the ICU, mainly intermediate care units or pneumology units, uh, also wards, and high flow nasal cannula mainly in the ICU, trying to avoid intubation. Why some patients are responding or not is not very clear. Which is very clear yes. is some patients have a high respiratory drive. And, and they are working with a high word of breathing and high respiratory rate. So we test response to CPAP or high flow nasal cannula according respiratory rate. And we take the decision to intubate or not based on that if we can reduce work of breathing or respiratory rate. As CPAP, as um, ceiling of therapy, we have a good experience in that. So some, some of those patients we don't admit in the ICU are, and are treated by, by the pneumologists in the intermediate care unit using CPAP, 50% of them could be discharged from the hospital. So I think this is an important message for those patients we are not treating in the ICU. Thank you very much indeed. And it's, it's Luigi isn't here from St. Thomas's. And it is important, I think, to say that there is a, a diversity of, of practice. And the St. Thomas's site in Great Britain has been much more in favor of early intubation. 
and at the moment we're trying to work out where the signals of um, benefit or harm are there for either group so I, and this, you're hearing a sort of consensus view of what people are doing but we need to ascertain whether what we're doing is the right thing to do um, Eduardo from the Cleveland Clinic might I ask you the United States experience here please uh, thank you Hugh uh, our experience has been mainly using high flow nasal cannula uh, as the main driver and and following some of the the rock score and evaluating it often to see where the patients are and following them through their, their stay. We do allow the use of, of non-invasive ventilation, but again, very close monitoring of the tidal volume on these patients. Uh, uh, but indeed, the majority of our patients as they have progressed and come to our unit have gone from high flow nasal cannula directly to intubation, uh, similar to the other speakers. Thank you very much. And of course, there is a conversation going on about whether the uh, degree of respiratory alkalemia may actually be of benefit in terms of the, the sort of um, impact on the virus itself. And there's a trial I understand about to start of bicarbonate use in patients for an alkalemic process to try to get the virus. So what we're hearing then is high flow nasal oxygen is used. Um, remember, of course, in cohorted areas that you do need full PPE for that. These are all aerosol generating procedures. Others are using CPAP. We're hearing that roughly 50% of people seem not to progress to intubation, but we haven't yet got representation here from others who are intubating a little earlier. But that's a conversation we can bring back to this table in the future. So I'd like to move on then so we don't overrun onto the issue of mechanical ventilation. So let me um, look to Andre just for a change, um, uh, who works in South London. Andre, you have intubated your patient. Um, six weeks ago, we were all being told high PEEP run them dry. Um, yet, what's your experience now of the compliance of the lungs of these people? Um, are they highly compliant? Are they highly congested? And what's your view in where you start with PEEP and tidal volumes? Uh, thanks, Hugh. Um, so, I think it's critical to assess where in the patient's illness journey they are uh, to, to decide what ventilatory uh, approach you're going to apply here when you've intubated people. Um, the, the further down their journey are, the more likely they are to be uh, the sort of low compliance picture that we see. But particularly if you're intubating early as at St. Thomas's, there's a relatively high compliance picture that we see, uh, low lung volume, uh, Luciano Gattinoni's of course uh, published some data on that. Um, and we would suggest in those cases that when, when intubated, one frequently sees compliant lungs relatively large tidal volumes going down on the PEEP seems to improve oxygenation. Uh, I think the issue of um, fluid balance is, of course, key in, the, in, in that balance there, and one needs a rather more generous fluid balance than what we originally started with, I think, partly to improve oxygenation as well and improving the VQ mismatch. I think if Luigi comes on, he would be advocating at this point uh, possibly early proning as well in this phase. I think as we move down the illness journey, if it's perhaps further down, one sees more of a, a sort of a low compliance picture with edematous lungs. Uh, and under those circumstances, we would uh, uptitrate the PEEP um, and apply more of a lung protective ventilation that more of us are familiar with. Thank you, Andre. And you're starting, uh, you're starting straight away with, I mean, we're starting low PEEP too. We measure the compliance, static compliance. If they're highly compliant, we're low PEEPing now. And as you say, that seems to improve pulmonary perfusion, and therefore oxygenation. Um, maybe I'd be making a mistake, though. I've started at six mils per kilo, which is our standard for lung protective ventilation. When we were speaking the other day, um, Luigi was talking about avoiding collapse and actually starting these people on a slightly higher tidal volume of eight mils per kilo. Do you have a view on that and any experience of outcomes with different strategies? Yeah, I'd agree. I think early in the disease trajectory, um, higher tidal volumes, uh, sort of around the 8 mil per kilo mark, uh, certainly seem to uh, be better. Um, the, I think one needs to be looking closely at the driving pressure um, and the ergo trauma that the lungs are suffering. Uh, so we try to limit driving pressure in these people, but frequently yeah. in the early phase of the disease, the, the compliance is good and low tidal volumes seem to cause uh, it more collapse and it's trauma. 
Yes, I mean, th that maybe I've been getting that wrong. I think we were starting with six and I, we are seeing the collapse. Dan Martin, before I move out elsewhere, um, Dan, you've got a lot of experience in the other side of London, up in the north, uh, as one of our major surge centres. What, what have you been doing and have you changed your practice now? And have you seen differences in that modification of practice? I think uh, similarly to Andre, we were uh, using much higher peeps to start with. Uh, and, and I've moved away from that uh, a great deal now. Uh, and it's possible that that's helped um, in, in a number of ways, uh, uh, one of which is to, to, to perhaps uh, reduce the overall burden of acute kidney injury. We were seeing this bad acute kidney injury uh, initially, which we may have been uh, sort of contributing to uh, with the high peaks, reducing venous return, um, perhaps. Uh, and anecdotally, although I don't have the data for it at the moment, I, I think that high degree of acute in kidney injury that we we're seeing early on is, is less common now. But I, I guess we'll see in a week or so's time when, when that fully happens. But certainly, we have altered our strategy as time has gone on. And I think that's an important thing for people to take on board, uh, this ability to adapt as we learn. Uh, thank you, Dan. And to praise you to, for the sake of time, our conversation earlier in the week, um, mm. many of us were running people very, very dry to start with, with norepinephrine to sustain pressures. And most of us have found over time that actually running people with a little more fluid helps pulmonary perfusion. And of course, the differential in shunt fraction can improve oxygenation as long as we maintain RV loading adequately. Um, Eduardo, um, can I ask you the same questions, but also ask you to start touching on secretion management? Because some of us are finding very, very thick secretions at times, a lot of plugging, even on wet circuits. Um, others are finding dreadful flooding of lungs on proning or reversing. And others are not seeing this very much at all. What's your experience, firstly, of the ventilation strategy you're using, and secondly, of secretion management? Thank you. We chose a strategy of using a PEEP table. Uh, we have uh, evolved uh, some time, but, uh, somewhat, but I would say that it was easier for us in the setting of a pandemic to see how we are ventilating the rest of our patients, seeing that we're compliant by using something that we can, we can monitor uh, with the with the evidence that has been coming out or the opinions that have been coming out, we have now moved towards allowing uh, the, and the high peak table at, at the same time based on on the characteristics of the patient. Perhaps on our experience, we have seen more of what you're calling the H type uh, uh, patients, um, and that's perhaps why the outcomes that we have seen so far. But uh, I think that it's easier to monitor the practice when you stick to what we knew to do well, which was the ARDS cares. So we're treating them as ARDS patients, without a doubt. Regarding the, well, the go ahead. No, please carry on. And, and regarding the secretion management, uh, it's a major issue. We have uh, had several cases of critical airway uh, obstruction on the ET tubes, having uh, secretions that essentially blocked. You could still pass the, the suction catheter. Uh, and the only telltale sign, because there were not large amount of secretions on these patients, was an increase in resistance or features yeah. of obstructive physiology, uh, leading us to change a number of those ET tubes in these patients. Uh, and now starting clearance uh, with either mucomist or even other devices to try to clean, clean them out. Well, the, indeed, and this would be my experience too with um, this very thick, clear, gelatinous secretion that is really hard to get up even through a bronchoscope with lots and lots of saline down there. Uh, Ricard, what are you discovering there? Are you finding the same problems? And are you using an uh, N-acetylcysteine or carbocysteine or uh, <clears throat> hypertonic saline? What's your strategy for managing these patients? Yes, we have the same we have the same problems problem with Marcos uh, plugging. So we are using wet circuits. Uh, prone position is very good also to drain secretions. So for both for improving BQ and also for draining secretion, prone position is is quite good. And then we are using bronchoscopes uh, to aspirate secretions. This is the our strategy. Uh, thank you. And Bjorn, are you using, uh, are you waiting for people to plug or are you putting people routinely on uh, mucolytic or are you putting NS, uh, we were hearing Mervyn the other day talking about using uh, hypertonic saline only if there's a plugging issue. What's your approach? Is it prophylactic or are you, uh, or are you tr tr treating only when there's a problem? 
Yeah, definitely. We are also aware of the problem, and we also have the problem of clotting and. Uh, we actually do a lot of prophylactic things. So we use wet circuits as well. We do uh, use Umbroxol here. We you do you use ACC, and we uh, actually also uh, do inhalation. But what we also do is a lot of chest physio in those patients to make sure that um, actually the secretion is mobilized uh, in the early cause. But generally, the experience is the same. And if I might add, I would like to uh, agree to Andre when he said one fits all approach doesn't work here at all, because we see very different phenotypes. And we're also going more the Eduardo way with having our PEEP table, the uh, ARDS uh, network PEEP table, and we rather approach the low PEEP from coming from a, a rather high level, because we made the experience that after intubation, patients do frequently deteriorate and we need some kind of, you know, we need some kind of safety early after intubation and then we try to aim at a little bit lower PEEP um, in the consecutive hours and days. Um, thank you very much indeed. Can I ask our Ch Chinese colleagues again what their experience is, but also to move on as well to discuss the use of um, adjuncts to try to improve EQ matching. So inhaled nitric oxide, if you have any experience, or prostacycline, for instance. Um, you know, do our Chinese colleagues have any views on these issues? Okay. So if for the secretion management, we also use the chest physiotherapy. And also we do the bios uh, uh, bronchoscopy in patients uh, like regularly, because this is quite helpful according to our opinion. And we, we will use, uh, during the uh, bronchoscope, we will do the infusion of interferon and also the uh, acetyl staining, right, the, the and acetyl cysteine. We will do this inhalation. So that's our opinion. Thank you very much. A strong feed here that secretions are a big problem. Um, we're also seeing some very peculiar issues um, with very swollen airways and trying to extubate people. Um, and actually enough, a run of this week of angioedema as well, which we'd not seen before. Dan Martin, I think you raised this originally, were the first to raise the flag in Great Britain about this being a problem with airways, with extubation particularly. Could you tell us your experience of this? Uh, yes, we noticed very early on uh, uh, at the beginning of this uh, uh, process that, that the ones that we were extubating, we would have to rapidly uh, reintubate, and the problem was stridor. Uh, and when we uh, looked down with the laryngoscope for the reintubation, they had very swollen airways, and this happened repeatedly uh, to the point where we now, uh, as part of our extubation protocol, uh, do a, a cuff leak test uh, to make sure that there's an adequate leak. Uh, prior to extubation, and if we don't find a leak at all, we start using dexamethasone for uh, 24, 48 hours um, and hoping that a leak comes. But th this has been, uh, uh, we've probably seen it in about 5% or so of, of cases now, over the 120 people that we've intubated, uh, this sort of um, uh, lack of a leak at any point when looking at them. So is this, um, I'm going to open this to the floor, um, wave at the camera if you uh, want to speak or go to the chat box and tell me that you'd like to. Is this, is this a common experience? It's certainly we're seeing this now as we're beginning to get to people extubate them. And it's surprising because these are people all two weeks down the line. Um, Mervyn, were you raising a finger to wave or are you on another line? No, just waving. Sorry, I was just chatting. We, we, I, I agree with you, Hugh. It's a small number, but you know it you know ideally avoidable but we're tending to wait a day or two longer before, than we normally would just to make sure that they do have a good leak as dan was saying yes any others got the same or different experience okay um, can i then ask, sorry please carry on we have very very similar experiences here I think it's not only at excavation. Um, having intubated a number of people recently who've been on CPAP, uh, when you first looked on, their airways were already edematous. Um, oh, and during and post intubation, we've had hemorrhagic airways. We've had to bronchoscope, as per the Chinese experience, to suck blood clots and sort of particular hemorrhage away. Uh, and after Dan raised the alert, we are also waiting for cuff leak using dexamethasone. 
Uh, we also notice we're having to reposition tubes very frequently. Uh, yeah. Tubes seem to migrate up, down, and this is independently of proning as well. That's a very interesting point, Andre, because that I'd not heard anyone say that before. But that's exactly our experience too. It, it's it's most peculiar, and I've also been quite confused by the graphics that some patients seem to move into a pattern that looks, frankly, as if the cuffs herniated, and you'd look at it and think, well, they're just obstructed on the way in and out, and you put the bronchoscope down and you just can't see anything. It doesn't respond to nebulizers. It doesn't look like a classic asthmatic pattern. But there's something limiting airflow in and out, which which is most people, I guess, must be this this edema issue. Has anyone here been using uh, nitric oxide? Um, Mervyn, I think you've used nitric oxide, and maybe others have used prostacycline. It, does, is there a role for nitric oxide, Mervyn, or is it just to put the numbers better for a few days and then and give up? I must admit, I'm not a great fan. I think yeah, the numbers look better, and we're treating ourselves, you know, and it just it, it's resonant of the ARDS trials where, you know, we pat ourselves on the back by making the numbers look better, but does it make any difference to outcomes? <gasps> Probably not. So I, I'm I'm sitting on the fence. Okay, or, and, and or, or, or falling off it. Falling off it on the side against. Um, prostacycline. Is anyone using nebulized or infused prostacycline, and do you have a good experience or not? I've not yet tried it. I don't know. Bjorn, have you been trying it at all? No, what we do use is nit nitrous oxide as well in uh, as a rescue therapy, actually, or as a right heart therapy if necessary. Uh, we don't see a lot of right heart dysfunction at the initial disease phase, to be honest, and we see a very moderate effect of uh, INO for those patients. So uh, we see a much better effect in proning, so patients are usually proned, and INO is there for special cases, and we don't use the other ones except from their usual indications. Thank you. And, and Ricard, in Spain, have you been using um, have you been using nitric oxide or have you been using prostacycline at all? Maybe he's not available to talk to us just at the moment. Uh, and our Chinese colleagues, do you have any experience of these adjuvant therapies of nitric oxide or prostacycline? Um, we neither. We didn't use this. You didn't. Okay. I mean. It's hard to know whether these are going to make a difference, as Mervyn says, to just improve the numbers or not. Let me move on then to fluid balance. We were all told to run these people dry, but increasingly we realised early on at least that um, we needed to maintain pulmonary flow. Um, I guess we're all falling into the camp of fill adequately to sustain flow and don't let them run too wet, watching for the albumins to fall later in that change in colloid osmotic pressure. I see you nodding there, Andre. Is that your view? And how are you managing circulations at the moment? Uh, so, yes, it is my view. We uh, originally ran people too dry. I think we precipitated a few acute kidney injuries from doing that. Uh, we very quickly started seeing people with sodiums into the 160 range. Uh, so they free water depletes. And of course, they've been hyperpyrexial for days, sometimes weeks. Uh, they may have been on CPAP hyperventilating, unable to drink. We've very much moved away from a restrictive fluid strategy towards a sort of individualized fluid strategy for that patient, depending on where in their disease uh, trajectory they are. And very hard though, Andre, isn't it, to manage these people's fluid balance by conventional means? Because certainly when you're double gloved, feeling skin turgor or, or how dry the skin is or mucous membranes, measuring CVPs in strange positions, getting Dopplers or whatever monitoring you want to put in there. Um, any tips on overcoming those sorts of challenges? We, we're um, uh, PICO enthusiasts locally, uh, whatever you make of that. So we will frequently, particularly in those relatively unusual cases where patients need vasopressors uh, or inotropes, we will uh, very early put PICO monitoring in. What's really interesting in, in this group of patients is despite being appearing to be intravascularly depleted, the lactates by and large are, 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 are normal. Uh, and that to me is, is a very strange observation. I think yes, and there's something metabolic going on here, isn't there? We're all seeing the same profoundly hypoxic and perhaps underfilled patients with limited, we can come to shortly, the vascular issues here. 
uh, highly insulin resistant lactates also not going up. Eduardo, you're nodding that too. You're experiencing this and how are you managing these? I mean, they are tricky, aren't they, these patients uh, with their circulation, particularly if we come too shortly with the vascular, pulmonary vascular complications and the right ventricular problems that can sneak in. How are you managing your patients fluid balance wise? So the initial, uh, we resuscitate them. I, I, I completely agree with Andre. They come in dry uh, from the process. Uh, and then the approach has been to use the, the fact light protocol uh, to, to keep them on the negative side as much as, uh, as possible once that we have resuscitated them. And usually this is 48, 72 hours after, after getting in. We use total weight because that probably is the, the, the best uh, marker that we have as well as the total fluid balance, knowing that there's a lot of uh, variation there. Uh, and then the, elect the electrolytes that we are easily able to obtain. When there's questions, we, we are uh, point of care enthusiast uh, ultrasound. So we do a fair amount of point of care ultrasound to try to balance on some of these patients and see how the, the heart and the, the vessels are doing th through the process. So we, we it's, it's a compound of items, but in, in general, after they have been resuscitated, we try to get them back into, into uh, either even or negative weight. Oops, sorry. Ricard, is this your experience as well? How are you managing the circulations? Running them dry or, as we're hearing, resuscitate and then run dry maybe 72 hours later? Um, no, we are running patients quite dry, quite dry. And we are, we are using echo a lot, a lot just to test uh, myocardial dysfunction, also uh, line B in the lungs, and also um, uh, fluid responsiveness. So uh, mainly uh, we are using echo for management, not a lot of pico catheters, not any swan gun catheters, mainly echo management. Okay, so again, echo, and we've heard this echoed elsewhere, if you excuse the bad pun, for looking at B lines and so forth as well for lung water. And mm -hmm. in Luigi, when he was with us earlier in the week, was looking at using ultrasound to assess how much of the lung is solid and how much is actually aerated to help guide that management as well. Um, I think we might have uh, exhausted that for now, and we do need to move on a little bit. Um, let me start with Bjorn, renal failure. Now, we took a straw poll earlier in the week with our conversations, and there seemed to be quite a variation. Some hospitals reporting instances of maybe 12%, and others reporting in intensive care instances much close to that which we're experiencing, which is close to 35%. What's your experience? and have you spotted any trends in your management that may have influenced the prevalence of, of this condition? This is a pretty tricky question. So I would say we generally, I would like to start to say that we see um, what is a very common phenotype in COVID-19 patients is something we really rarely see in outside COVID. We see patients that have really a single organ failure. They come with a really severe hypoxia Despite from the hypoxia, they are they seem to be healthy. So they have no kidney injury, they have uh, no cardiodynamic, cardiovascular failure. Uh, but we see a really single organ failure in those patients. And but we see some patients that differ from this phenotype. So we see patients with a very hyperinflammatory course, and those patients. Uh, usually also are more prone and more likely to develop multi-organ dysfunctions. So these patients are on vasopressors. These patients have um, all the, the, the things we know from sepsis, all the typical organ dysfunctions. And I think a little bit the, the amount, or it depends a little bit on which kind of patients you see in your, in your institution, how, how, how many of these more like hypo-inflammative patients you see, which have only the single organ failure, on how big is the, the, the rate. I have no data regarding um, the real rate. It, it feels like we're more in this very average uh, 10 to 25 percent, depending on the setting we look at. Um, but it might be in, in, on those wards that observe higher amounts that those have more hyperinflammative courses of the disease. So what we actually do is what was said before. We try to manage uh, fluids. Uh, we use a lot of echo, a lot of point of care ultrasound to uh, manage the fluids. And uh, 
yeah, we usually have a good experience. But what we see is that in the later course of the illness, some of the patients that had a single organ failure develop a very, very high inflammatory level, and they are also more prone than to develop renal failure, of course, as part of that. Thank you, Bjorn. Um, Tony, I'm going to come to you as well. So we're, uh, our experience as well is, I think that of many others, we're seeing a lot of proteinuria. We're seeing a lot of fine, what looks like sand clogging up urinary catheters. We're, we're, it's not unusual for us to have to replace urinary catheters because they're blocking off. Um, we're also not seeing renal failure per se in our CPAP patients. It seems to be a phenomenon very peculiar to the ones that hit intensive care. What's your thought, Tony? Is that because they've just got so sick and they are that group where you're going to start getting multi-system failure? Or is it because we're doing something that's not healthy? High peaks, for instance, high airway pressures, uh, low intravascular volumes. What's your experience and what do you think we might be doing right or wrong? I think you've hit the nail on the head there here, is that we're seeing in intensive care a slightly different population, either genetically um, or because of the other things that have happened in the past or because of the time frame that the disease has developed over. Um, and so, and the other, the other thing that struck me was that the differing rates of um, renal replacement therapy requirements probably reflect two things. Firstly, our um, lack of a good definition of what constitutes the need for renal replacement therapy. Um, and secondly, um, resource allocation. So one of the things we're finding, for instance, in our intensive care is that if we applied renal replacement therapy as frequently as we would like to, we'd run out of supplies. And so we're having to move our threshold all the time. And then, of course, we're looking back on that data and inferring treatment uh, decisions out of that. So, so I think for us, we have to be a little bit careful about what constitutes normal therapy against what constitutes therapy in the time of COVID when there's resource implications in everything that you do. But going back to the point you were trying to make, yes, I think the intensive care patients we see who are ventilated are indeed different. And the Chinese experience, if I could come to China on this, your experience, I think, was that you saw slightly less renal failure than we're seeing or we think we're seeing in Great Britain. Is, is that correct? And if so, why do you think your patients were doing better than ours? OK, so just as we mentioned last time, around like 15 percent of the patients have renal failure in our center. And according to because we did uh, uh, just uh, we discussed it before, we didn't use very high PIP in these patients. Yeah. So we, yeah. we use lower, like less than 10 centimeter water column. So we don't think this is an issue in our center. Uh, but alternatively, we think maybe disease, the viral infection itself per se, or secondary infection lead to like shock of infection, maybe lead to the renal failure in our center. So, and according to our experience, we think that patients were more, more likely to have albuminuria. Yes. And the increase, the level, increased level of urine nitrogen is much higher than that of uh, creatine. Of CR. So that's our experience. Okay. And, and very, very good points made. A, a paper earlier this week, which some of us have seen, that echoes exactly what you've just said that the virus seems to be upregulating the ACE2 uh, protein, which acts as a receptor in the proximal tubule, and that the uptake of the coronavirus into the proximal tubule is causing cellular necrosis in the proximal tubule. And, and so your point is exceedingly well made that whilst we're all beating ourselves up about fluid balance and so forth, uh, this may well just be a direct effect of the of the virus itself, and why one person is differentially affected than another may be down to the genome of that particular patient. Um, I'm looking around. There's lots of thumbs up there. Okay, that seems to be a general consensus. Would anyone like to make other comments? I'm looking at the chat box as well. If you want to flag anything of our panel before we move on, anyone else internationally? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be devil's advocate and disagree with you because it's very unusual to see, you know, even in patients who come in with severe respiratory failure to see renal dysfunction at the beginning. And so it tends to be a later phenomenon 
are usually after they've been ventilated for days. That's been our experience, and I think it's a fairly general experience. So, so while I'm not excluding a direct viral influence, and there's been some post-mortem reports on the, uh, the renal tubule, I, I do wonder about the iatrogenic component, and that was raised earlier. You know, the high, I think um, Andre made the point earlier about the high airway pressures, um, and then you'll get a back pressure on the renal vein. So, you know, I, I do um, challenge the notion that it's all uh, the disease-driven process. That, that's my bit. Well, thank you, Mervyn. And again, it, um, yes, Tony, you'd like to make a comment. Yeah, uh, what we seem to be seeing on our data is a dichotomization at about day five. Now, whether that's because we've caused five days' worth of damage through ventilation, or whether that's the point at which the virus is deciding to kill somebody, um, it's difficult to say. But but I think the problems all turn around around day five, and they're with everything: ventilation, cardiovascular, renal failure, everything. That's a good point, and very interesting. I think we uh, some of our early reading failures, to pick up on Mervis' point, uh, was because we started five weeks ago with high PEEP and running them dry. When we stopped doing that, we didn't see the renal, the kidneys giving up in the first 36 hours, and we are now seeing it much later. And it's a point I'd just like to raise here. This is a real need, I think, for international data sharing. And Mike Roberts is on this call from UCL Partners, and this is something we're trying very hard to quickly get together because whilst this sort of data sharing we're doing now is helpful in teasing out opinions of wise people who've seen lots of patients, we really do need to get to granular data. And I know, Tony, that your centre is now collaborating with UCL in sharing big data to try to understand a little bit more about what's going on. And I'd strongly encourage anyone on this call uh, who wishes to share data to try and find a way of doing so. Um, we have 15 minutes to go. And I will allow people to come back at the end of this, uh, because I'm aware that I'm probably talking over some people um, that would wish to comment. So, again, there is a chat function in the top right. Hugh? If you are a speaker. Yes, Sandy. Hi, Hugh. There's some questions from the um, delegates out there on the webinar. Um, quite a few are asking about when do the panel think proning should start when a patient is ventilated? Ah, OK. So a very good question. Um, all right, okay, I'm going to spin past that one out. Ricard, you're, you're sitting there. When, we should, when do you prone a patient? If it was you, at what point? Would you want to be prone the moment you hit ITU, or would you want to wait? Uh, so we are doing some awake proning before ICU admission, but uh, I'm not sure that this is, uh, we are not doing this anymore, not because it's unsafe, because uh, we are doing ICU admission much be uh, before now, because uh, some days ago it was very difficult to get an ICU bed. So we try to keep right. the patients outside. We need to prevent ICU admission, and we are proning outside of the ICU with a weight proning. In patients in mechanical ventilation, we are proning a lot, especially in those patients with a PO2 FiO2 ratio below 150. Um, right. uh, so this is the typical uh, threshold for proning. Right, so PF ratio 150. Bjorn, you're nodding at that. Would you agree with that as a threshold? Yes, this is also what we actually practice here at uh, Charité, that we use a threshold of about 150 uh, for proning. And uh, so the question is also, uh, what is the effect of proning in this specific kind of disease? You know, is it just to uh, increase PF ratio for the moment, or does it have some therapeutic effect? I, again, I would say you're completely right. We need the data for this to say that in the end if those patients had a survival benefit, because we don't know if it is really happening. What we do know is that we can bridge, like, uh, hard times. Yeah. Well, it's our experience, too. I mean, it makes the number a lot better, mm -hmm. and it makes it better, but I'm not sure that it works. Antoine, you were wanting to talk. Yeah, yes, ju just just a comment about, uh, about the previous one and the pruning in general. I, I mean, you, usually I agree that we do not have to cure any numbers and very curious disease, I really like any intervention that may save time. And I mean, even if there is no direct uh, impact on prognosis, I know that because the patient is less severely hypoxemic, I save time for the recovery, uh, let's say the natural recovery of the disease. And this is why we do a lot of proning, 
In mechanically ventilated patients, we use a, a surgeon team. So they came twice a day in my unit uh, during the morning just to put uh, the patient in croning and at the end of the afternoon to uh, uh, the, the morning right after, sorry, uh, to return the, the patient. So they help us uh, a lot. And second, in spontaneously breathing patient, a wet patient, we do a lot of proning in this kind of yeah. patient under high flow oxygen. And once again, we improve a lot the oxygenation. I don't know what is the body safe time to, uh, uh, to allow the natural recovery of the disease. Thank you. Is, is anyone using a threshold lower than 150? Anyone holding their nerve longer than that? Dan's looking quizzical. Or you just... Uh, uh, no, I was simply making the conversion to kilopascals. <laughs> right. Okay, so that's fine. But, okay. I, would agree, I would agree with 150 is about our threshold. Uh, okay. And we've used proning extensively. Uh, we, we tend to try and do a, three sessions as a minimum uh, and then make an assessment after there. But, but I'm sure, like others, we have found that as the disease progresses, the, the proning becomes less and less effective with time. Thank you very much. And Andre's putting a thumb up there. That's exactly our experience, too. And it's a conversation, perhaps, that we're not going to have to have time today, which is when you decide you're going to try to wean people in, in what way. But I'd like to give them time. I do want to move on to a very, very important issue because this is really rising up the ranking. And this is the issue of coagulopathy. Um, the post-mortem data we've seen from Italy showing quite a lot of distal pulmonary arterial clot, whether it's thrombosis or embolus. Um, we'd, uh, uh, yes, we've, uh, thank you very much. Yes, I've just lost a few people there. Um, we're seeing a, a lot of clot appearing. We're hearing conversations about large scale um, I suppose, uh, proximal pulmonary artery thrombosis, we've seen quite a few of those. So the question I'd like to put to everybody is, how are you managing this? We all know they're highly prothrombotic. Are we, how do we screen? Do we start treating people prophylactically with heparin? How do we monitor that if we're finding that in fact, without the factor 10A levels, we don't know if people are anticoagulated, or do we just wait and scan people for clot? I see Mike Grocott's on the call there, Mike. I hadn't spotted you before. Um, let's give you a chance to say something, Mike. What's your experience of thrombosis now in the Southampton, the south coast of England, and how are you managing these patients? Are you, are you taking a prophylactic view, or are you scanning to intervene when you find clot? How are you, how are you coping? Uh, we have, uh, I guess we've shifted our... Uh, approach to anticoagulation compared to normal. So we're doing a, a little bit more for any given level of risk. So we're um, we're going for subcut heparin three times daily is pretty much routine unless they're very, um, very lightweight. Um, we uh, will shift to Clexane, um, which we believe to be a little bit more efficacious uh, if we've got any additional concerns. And then we're, we're obviously anticoagulating on the filter with heparin. So we're, we're citrate users traditionally. Uh, and um, if we see D-dimers that are either rising or uh, in excess of a thousand with other other clinical uh, factors that would worry us, we we haven't, and we've been talking a lot about it this week. We haven't done a huge amount of um, CT scanning for full bone PE. We've had, we're, I think, moving to do that more uh, over sort of yesterday, today, and going forward. And we certainly had a report from a local hospital, and as it's not them, I'll let them remain, remain anonymous, but, but did um, 10 CTPAs this week, of which I think seven were positive. Right, um, so, uh, so our, your point, very well made point, Mike. So after a conversation on Friday last week, one of the national calls, we scanned all of ours on CPAP on the ward uh, that weren't shifting. So the Mervyn group getting to day three still rather stuck. And every single one of them had large proximal pulmonary arterial clot. Um, Rather worryingly, again, just to draw this out and welcome other people's experience, uh, the call we'd had at that time was suggesting that we weren't really managing to heparinize people. We were putting them on treatment dose, um, and indeed that seems to be the case. So the data we got back from this morning are that of the 12 on treatment dose heparin of various sorts, uh, yesterday, 10 of them are not effectively anticoagulated when we measure the clotting factors directly. 
So um, let me put that to some of our others. Uh, it, China, again, you started with this. Uh, and we read your papers about using thromboprophylaxis. What was your experience of thrombotic or embolic events? And how did you manage your cases with either prophylaxis or treatment? Okay, so um, uh, I want to make sure the, the question, so it's like how we, uh, use prophylaxis of the the slum voices. Is this the question? Okay. Hi. So I want to make sure the question is: um, Are you asking the the prophylaxis strategy for the the slum biosis? Yes, please. Okay, so okay, so if uh, in our center we are doing the the Cabrini score, the investigation of this score, and we will depend on this score to set up the uh, have, um, the strategy of in the how do you say that coagulation. So and yes. we do ultrasound very frequently to find whether there is signs of the uh, thrombosis in vascular. That's what we do. Okay. And, yeah, and actually, uh, according to the result you showed in the paper, actually, we the, the rate in our center is, I, we think it's lower, not that high, actually. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and yeah. what are others, thank you. What are others experiencing? Um, Ricard, can I come to you? Are you seeing a lot of obvious pulmonary thromboembolic or clot in the lung that you're seeing clinically with high PA pressures, for instance, or blown RVs, or, or are you not seeing that? So, yeah, we are seeing that a lot. So we did this week a point prevalence study with, uh, with the vascular surgeons, and we observed like 25% uh, of the patients have deep venous thrombosis in the ICU. So, of course, those patients now are un under uh, anticoagulation, but this is something you have to look for because uh, most of the cases are asymptomatic. We are doing also an anticoagulation protocol for those patients who are hypoxemic, again, PO2, FO2 ratio below 150, and they dimer above 1,500. Maybe better is dead space, but uh, it's much more easy to measure PO2, FO2 ratio but uh, physiologically, maybe it makes more sense to do data space, but when you have such amount of patients and several teams taking care of patients, we, we took that decision. PO2, FO2 ratio before, below 150, and DDIMR above 1,500. Okay, and Tony, can I come to you on this? Because I know you've raised some concerns on this. I, our experience is the same. Uh, although we see DDIMR, I mean, if I saw a DDIMR of 1,500, I'd be absolutely delighted because many of ours are in the many, many tens of thousands. They're often hard mm. to get to CT. Um, and then it's hard to know whether one goes to full anticoagulation monitoring 10A, which does seem to be important. But you have some concerns, don't you, Tony, about the prospect of cerebral hemorrhage in people with high CO2s? Um, well, it was really just a reflection on the fact that just prior to the COVID crisis hitting the UK, the REST trial was stopped. Um, and obviously the REST trial was a trial of extracorporeal CO2 removal for which you needed to anticoagulate the circuit. Um, and that what they found was in the intervention group, they had to stop the trial early because of an increased risk of intracerebral bleeds. And it just struck me that we had exactly the same situation now. We were ventilating uh, with lung protective ventilation in COVID with raised CO2s, and then we were going to try and anticoagulate. And certainly when the REST team were beginning to unpick why they had to suspend, um, they'd found some papers that had suggested an increased risk of intracerebral bleeding associated with anticoagulation in the presence of high CO2. But I'm afraid that's as much as I can speculate. Thank you. And what about the United States experience here? I'm sorry, I've, I've been rather remiss in, in not coming to you directly. Um, what's your experience here? And again, 
should we be scanning the legs of everyone every day? Should we be looking to the lungs? Should we be echoing people, treating rises in D-dimers, treating changes in ECG or echo? What, what's your experience and thoughts, please? Uh, well, what we well, our experience is similar to yours. We see a lot of DVTs, and actually, uh, some of my my peers that do a lot of ultrasound have been seeing a lot of smoke, and they call it low flow state in the in the vessels. Uh, the significance of that is unclear to us, but we decided, as we discussed, the uh, to use the D dimer at 3,000 as the cutoff for us, um, based on the Chinese literature, and then. Uh, we we'll continue to monitor the D-dimer throughout, but we are using a higher intensity prophylaxis. We normally used heparin before, now we have moved to low molecular weight heparin for prophylaxis on these patients. And on those patients that come back positive on the point of care DVT ultrasound that we're doing uh, intermittently, they go to full anticoagulation uh, monitoring, as you, as you have mentioned, uh, if, it, if this is being effective either by APTT or the anti 10 levels uh, for this patient. So it's evolving. We, we, we are learning from this. So this is the ongoing protocol that we're using right now. Well, thank you. And I'm noticing that we have come to the end of time officially, and uh, I am going to draw it to a halt because I appreciate everyone has things to do. The infection side is a matter of evolving practice as well. And the conversations we had in preparation for this were that a lot of people using procalcitonin as a guide. Uh, and just a flag that some units such as our own and a few others were seeing quite high instances of fungal infection that we've never seen before, which we ascribe to a defect in T cell function, but we don't yet know. Um, on the call for the coagulation, um, there is a trial going on or several trials about to start, but I perhaps encourage off-grid here, uh, and you're welcome to contact the Intensive Care Society, so that'd be ASHA, A-S-H-A, -A, at ics.ac.uk. I'd like to see if we can't develop some sort of protocol together, everyone on this call perhaps, for creating a core data set. If we are going to start scanning limbs, for instance, or doing other imaging, it'd be really terrific terrific if we could find a way of reporting those data into a repository to get a much more granular feed because I think many of us on this call have grave anxiety about the way we're managing clot or not. I certainly do. I'm, I'm certain that my practice is not in any way optimal but I don't know what the answer is and I think that'd be great if we could address that. So I'm going to draw it all because we are two minutes over. I'd very much like to thank our audience for listening in. I hope you found it helpful. I'd really very much like to thank our international audience for having made a preparatory call earlier in the week and devoting time to that and devoting time again today for their wisdom and experience so eloquently communicated. Uh, I'd again like to thank the Intensive Care Society for putting this together and Mike Roberts and the UCL Partners team um, who have been fantastic behind the scenes at helping synthesise this. We will release a summary of this and perhaps an accumulated experience of data and encourage you to contact us again if you'd like to contribute to shared registries uh, and perhaps we'll come back to some of you more specifically with proposals uh, more directly in that in that regard so once again my thanks to all of you very much indeed it's genuinely felt i, I wish you um some sleep at night uh, and safe uh, travels in the future thank you for listening